again, this is uh, Jim Helwig from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and I also chair the U Portal Steering Committee. And I'd like to welcome everyone to the May 2016 U Portal Steering uh, U Portal Community Call. Uh, looking back, it's actually been a while since we've had a, a community call, but um, moving forward, we will try to have these on a more regular basis. And we're going to have Drew Wills uh, presenting um, what has been included in the U Portal 4.3 release. And Anthony Colborn is going to be demoing uh, the University of Manchester portal. And we should have time for some Q&A. So with that, I will let you take over, Drew, and tell us a little bit about what went into this most recent release. You got it, Jim. Uh, can you hear me, Jim? Yes. Uh, yeah, okay. I appreciate that. I don't want to start talking and uh, get lost and not be heard. Uh, all right. Yeah, terrific. Uh, <clears throat> as Jim mentioned, uh, we're going to look at the recent release of uPortal, we're going to do a University of Manchester uh, demo. Uh, we're going to talk about some future plans. We'll have some time for Q&A. Uh, here we have, uh, I'll start with, as I normally do with these kinds of things, start with a uh, screen capture of uh, uPortal, of the new version of uPortal, in this case uPortal 430. Uh, fresh, uh, fresh clone from Aperio, uh, just built and uh, you know and started. Uh, it's not uh, dramatically different visually from uh, 4.2 or 4.2.2, the most recent 4.2 release, uh, but there are a, a tremendous number of changes. Uh, I ran a report preparing for this call. And in fact, there are 126 JIRA tickets uh, that in a resolved or a closed state that have a fixed version tagged 430. Now, some of those, a, a minority, also have a fixed version 422 or some other 42 uh, version tagged on them, but a, a majority, a, I think a, a modest majority of those tickets are, uh, are are items, changes, updates in the um, in the four three U portal line only the four three and up. Uh, so some you know quick notable things about the four three release. Uh, we have support for both Java eight and Tomcat eight. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think we are targeting. I, this is declared in the readme now uh, that we are targeting uh, Java 8 and Tomcat 8 for the 4.3 line. Uh, for the present, I think they work in uh, Tomcat 7 and with Java 7, uh, but we, we don't commit to maintaining that with 4.3. We uh, are targeting Java 8 and Tomcat 8 uh, for this line and, and going forwards. Uh, one of the most important things that I need to mention or, or something, you know, particularly exciting about 4.3, uh, there was a, a very significant amount of performance tuning that went into to Uportal generally uh, in, in the kind of, in the few months prior to the 4.3 release. Uh, much of it went into 4.2, the 4.2.2 release as well, which, yeah, 4.3.0 came out on, a, I think, on a Monday, and 4.2.2 came out on the previous Friday. They came out essentially at the same time. Uh, much of, the, of that performance tuning and, and fixes and so forth, the, the performance improvements, uh, went into the 4.2.2 uh, release and the 4.2x line but not all of it. Uh, some of it only exists in the 4.3.0 uh, release and the 4.3, you know, and in, in master and the 4.3x line of uPortal. 
Uh, so if you want to get the best performance, this is the, uh, the release to target. Uh, another one, uh, you know, quick item that uh, I think is pretty exciting. Uh, many of you, I know many of you, many of you will, I, I know, have experience uh, managing fragment layouts using the, um, the fragment layout management tool. You, you're essentially impersonating the layout owner uh, account for the fragment. Uh, if you used restrictions on changes that um, that users could make, if you restricted personalization on fragments in any way, you you first had to, but you wanted to make changes as the owner, you first had to undo all those restrictions uh, previous to 4.3.0. You first had to, um, you know, open the the permission settings and, and uh, and click all the boxes for user may, you know, move portlets, user may uh, add tabs, that kind of thing, uh, before you could make any changes. And then you had to restore all your restrictions when you were done. Uh, that's kind of obnoxious. The the owner of the fragment ought to be able to ought to be able to make changes to the fragment layout, regardless of restrictions that are placed on other users who get the fragment. Uh, and that was implemented. That uh, change was made in 4.3.0. So uh, if you are the fragment owner, you go into manage fragment layouts. Uh, you get to make changes to, uh, you know, the fragment content with without uh, regard to any restrictions. Uh, I hope that's pretty clear. It's a bunch of Uportal speak. Uh, all right. So we updated uh, Uportal starting with 4.1. Uh, offers a brand new theme, uh, and that brand new theme is called Responder. Responder is the successor to universality. Responder is built on Bootstrap. Uh, it was built on an earlier version of Bootstrap 3. It, uh, for 430, it was updated to, to version 335. Uh, so we have a very recent version of Bootstrap included. Uh, speaking of updating versions, we updated, uh, I'd say, more than half of the portlets uh, got a new uh, updated version in uh, the bundled portlets, I mean, uh, in the 4.3 release. And the embedded CAS server was, had a, got a version upgrade as well. Uh, and now, so these are, you know, quick little bullet items to cover highlights. Uh, now we will cover some more visual highlights. In the Portlet Manager, importantly, now you may manage both the subscribe permission, which is the, the permission uh, that um, historically we've always managed in the Portlet Manager, uh, as well as the browse permission for a portlet. Uh, I hope uh, I'm seeing the chat and, and a whole bunch of things, so my window is really small, but I hope you guys can see uh, pretty well. Uh, under principles and categories down on the left, there's principles. Uh, it shows the, the, the groups or individuals that have been selected to receive some form of permission and it's in a table format with checkboxes. Typically, uh, for most portlets, like a calendar portlet uh, or a you know a newsfeed portlet, an email portlet, typically the people that you give permission uh, you know permissions to with regard to the portlet, typically you're going to give them both browse and subscribe. But this, uh, well, for one thing, this update allows you to to manage that here in the portal. And it also allows you to manage those, um, those permissions independently. So you can give subscribe but not browse, and you can give browse but not subscribe. Why would you want to do that? Well, in Responder, a number of portlets that appear in the header or footer or in um, you know, a sidebar uh, a number of, of portlets that are used to build the, the whole portal page that are not a part of the main tab column uh, content. Uh, those portlets you may not want users to find in the search or find in the portlet marketplace or find in the, the customized menu, the personalization gallery. 
You might not want them to add the logo for the portal or, or something like the attachments portlet, which is kind of a headless, invisible thing, uh, to, to their layout. Uh, that makes no sense. It leads to um, sort of non, nonsensical outcomes. And the way to prevent that is to make those portlets not visible when, when you're looking through portlets, when you're looking for portlets. The permission that controls that is the is the browse permission, and so you have um, now in the portlet manager you have a way, a good way, to say uh, you know these users may they may use the portlet uh, if it appears in their layout, uh, either in the tab column content or anywhere on the page. If it appears in their layout, they may render it, uh, but those users may not find it in the search or in in something like the portlet marketplace. Uh, this is an enhancement to the Portlet Manager portlet. Uh, we updated the No Chrome Options menu. Uh, we Historically, we have called this Hover Chrome, uh, historically. Let me talk a little bit more about historically. In earlier versions of uPortal, in, in universality-based uh, versions of uPortal, we had a, uh, had a publishing option for portlets that uh, that allowed the portal administrator to say this portlet should not have uh, portlet Chrome. It should not have a box around it. Uh, it should just appear, you know, without a without a box on the page. Uh, and Responder has that option too, but Responder uh, does one better or maybe several better. Uh, in Universality, we had a big problem once you once you published a portlet uh, that way. There was no way to move it or remove it or do anything to it because all the um, you know all the options for the, those kinds of things, uh, the interfaces for those kind kinds of things, were um, accessed through the portal Chrome. So in Responder, we have a, a new style of Chrome, which, as I said, traditionally we've called Hover Chrome. Uh, it, it used to be the case, and in 4.1 and 4.2, it's the case that if you mouse over uh, a portlet. You hover the mouse over a portlet, uh, an options menu appears that gives you access to those things. Uh, that's fantastic if you are, um, it works decently if you have a mouse and you like to use your mouse and you're on a uh, desktop or a laptop. Uh, but if you're using a touch screen like a mobile phone or a tablet, it's, it's pretty difficult to hover uh, over a portlet. So we have refactored that options menu, we have uh, sort of rebooted that style of Chrome instead to use this hamburger menu that you see uh, on the page. I've, I've expanded, uh, when I took this screenshot, I expanded the menu. It shows, in this case, the options that have been configured to be available for this, uh, this portlet. Uh, things like rate this portlet or maximize, remove this portlet, remove uh, all those options. Of course, add to my favorites. Uh, anyway, this reboot of the uh, of the Chrome, formerly known as Hover Chrome, uh, is intended to make the the UI um, you know more more comprehensively available on mobile devices. All right, next one. Uh, speaking of mobile devices, for four three zero, we rebooted the. Uh, you know the small display menu. If you're on a small, uh, small tablet uh, or a tablet in uh, portrait mode, uh, or if you're on a mobile phone, uh, you will you will most likely get a menu that looks uh, you know more like this. Instead of tabs across the top, uh, you know which there really isn't room for on a on a small display. Instead of tabs across the top, you'll get that that menu button at the very top. And by the way, that's sticky as you, uh, the bar across the top as, as you scroll down the page and look at other portlets, that bar stays in a fixed position at the top of the page. So the menu button is always visible. If you click on uh, the menu button, the whole page sort of, sort of shifts to the right. And this menu, uh, you know, representing the tabs, uh, you know, this UI for switching tabs, it appears over on this sort of off-canvas 
left-hand side, as you see there. Uh, this is a contribution from uh, the Aesop folks in France, uh, shepherded in significant part by Christian. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we, it was submitted originally as an optional alternative menu. Uh, when we uh, at last, unfortunately at last, got around to, to looking at it and, and merging it, uh, we we sort of took one look at it and said that's way better than what we have, and we just want to replace what we have with uh, with this because it's much sharper. <laughs> it's much more um, in line with I think what what users are used to uh, on the web in a responsive web page. So we did merge it. Uh, we I should warn you we are still uh, ferreting out a couple of uh, issues that. Uh, that iOS users have and possibly Android as well. Uh, the the uh, clicking on these things isn't isn't always working as intended. Uh, I think we have most of the issues addressed, uh, but we've introduced maybe one or two slight cosmetic issues in the process. So we're just kind of polishing the final solution for that. So you can expect, uh, you know, it's this is exactly what it looks like. Uh, at the tip of master right now, but you can expect a um, uh, an update to this, uh, a small fix for um, uh, for mobile operating systems uh, shortly, which we mostly have worked out. We're just polishing it cosmetically a bit. Uh, all right, next item: tenant manager. Uh, thanks to the good folks at Illini Cloud and their continued sponsorship of um, new capabilities for you portal. Uh, the, the tenant, uh, the, the system for tenants and the, the user interfaces, the administrative interfaces for tenants uh, got uh, updated significantly for the 4.3 release. Uh, the early tenant manager I would say was you know, kind of a something of a pilot or or a prototype. This takes us much closer to something that we can just use and rely on, and uh, you know, more much more sort of bulletproof and uh, and feature rich. Uh, for example, when you create a tenant, uh, the tenant manager now supports this notion of uh, of optional steps. There are mandatory steps uh, when you create a tenant, such as creating, you know, all the groups and so forth that uh, that you know a tenant uses uh, behind the scenes. But you can you can flag a step, and and these steps are configured in in Spring XML. You can tailor them, you know, to your heart's content. Uh, you can. Uh, you can now flag uh, steps in the tenant manager as optional, and if you do, they will appear with a checkbox next to them uh, like this. They're typically on by default, but uh, you have the option to uh, you know deselect them and and not run that that step when you create uh, a tenant. And when you when you create a tenant or when you delete a tenant or when you uh, update a tenant, you know, change the tenant metadata, or even if you just sort of uh, do, you know, send a, uh, resend the tenant email, the tenant welcome email. Uh, now, whenever you sort of perform an operation in the tenant manager, you get a report of what happened, uh, particularly creating tenants uh, updating tenants as well. A number of interdependent, somewhat complex things happen behind the scenes. Uh, and this report screen that pops up helps you understand uh, what it is that the tenant manager is doing and the you know success or, or, or lack of success uh, for each step in the process. Uh, I can, it's not on the slide, but I can tell you as well that some, uh, in addition to flagging steps as optional, you can also configure steps to, to be, um, not to fail the whole 
uh, not to fail the whole transaction if if they fail. You can say this step if it, um, it you know if this step does not succeed, just report that it didn't succeed, but don't kill the whole the whole deal. You know, let the tenancy finish, and you would be able to see uh, the outcome of those things. You know, whether those um, non mandatory steps. Uh, succeeded or not uh, right here in this report. So any significant interaction with tenants will produce uh, a report that kind of looks like this. Uh, it's not a very big screenshot uh, below this. There are other, you can see that there's a, a, a bootstrap panel that says uh, success tenant template data. There would be further panels, uh, you know, with less information in them typically. This is a very long one. Uh, but there would be more panels for the additional steps below this. Uh, and I think lastly, uh, as far as the tenant manager, the previous tenant manager had the ability to create tenants. Uh, and it had the ability to delete them, limited ability to delete them. But the, um, the update, you know, change tenant uh, metadata was not uh, available. It wasn't implemented in the previous tenant manager. Uh, the updates to the, the, the new tenant manager in 4.3, it's not really a new tenant manager, the updated tenant manager in 4.3, it has the ability to update uh, tenant metadata. Uh, you will get a screen that looks like this. You can change you know, the, the main metadata fields and, and when you're done, you can click update attributes, but you should also see uh, that all of those, I'm going to go back two slides, um, those optional steps uh, that you configured uh, for, the, for creating a tenant, uh, they are also available as optional operations uh, here on the tenant details screen. So if you need to, to rerun a part of the... Um, you know, tenant creation process, maybe a part that failed or a part that needs to be, you know, just sort of reprocessed. You can provide a button for that here uh, in, in the tenant manager right here on the tenant details screen. And again, all of these, all of these, uh, all the metadata fields, all the options, all the operations, all the steps that appear, that would appear in a report like this, these things are configurable using, uh, you know, the Spring application context. They they are they're beans in the context, and the the portlet, the the interface for managing tenants, just knows it discovers the beans that you provide. It analyzes the metadata on the beans, and it builds a UI for managing tenants based on on the steps that you provide. Uh, so these are, you know, cool and significant enhancements to the tenant manager, I think. Yep, I think that's it for me. Uh, the, I'm thinking maybe we move uh, directly to the demo and, um, you know, we should take um, questions in, in chat. I think that's probably our intent. If, if anyone has questions on what I've said, uh, feel free to type them at any time, and I, I may likely type a response uh, as we go, uh, but uh, I want to make sure that we have uh, enough time uh, for Anthony and uh, his, you know, show and tell of uh, the new Manchester portal. Uh, and, uh, of course, we will have a uh, Q&A portion after that. So let me, I'm going to mute myself and I'll hand it off to, to Anthony. Uh, hi everyone, and thanks Drew. I'm going to hopefully share my screen. It seems to be thinking about it. OK, 
Okay, hopefully you can all see my screen now. Um, <coughs> so, um, yeah, I've, uh, I'm, I'm using a full screen window, so i um, got the chat uh, down the side, so uh, I can hopefully answer any questions that come up. Uh, so this is the, uh, the new My Manchester um, guest screen. Um, so it is based on the 4.3 line. Uh, it's not quite 4.3.0. We were tracking the head up until around January time. Uh, then since then we've uh, cherry-picked um, the, the important performance fixes. Um, so we don't have the... Uh, the new um, sliding um, mobile menu that, that Bruce just demoed. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and log in. Okay, so um, I'm logged in here. As, uh, as myself, uh, I'm an administrator, so um, I'm just going to switch to uh, of our uh, test users, uh, say fully synthetic user. So um, I don't think there's a danger of um, leaking too much personal information anyway. So. It gives you all a chance to see um, the team in, in action a little bit. How do you look out, Holt? I'm doing that. Interesting. Shout a little bit. Okay, I'm doing my travel best. Uh, I actually turn the Dane right down on the microphone because uh, it seems to be really crackly earlier on. Okay, uh, while well, I've got the screen open, uh, it's probably worth um, giving you a quick kind of view of the attributes that, that we're uh, mapping in. Um, most of these come from uh, an LDAP system, uh, but there's one down here that actually comes from a relational database. Okay, thanks, Trey. I don't know much what I can do about it right now. Hopefully, it's Get by what I'm saying. Uh, but I wanted to show you the group uh, mappings down here. So we're using uh, JPA packs um, groups at the moment, and we have a large number of these things. We have uh, around about 300 uh, packs groups defined. So I think that's probably uh, at the higher end of, of what most people are using. Okay, so this is the uh, landing, landing page of a typical uh, student profile. Um, so we, we our student uh, marketing, student comms team, um, have a rethink uh, about how they classify their content. Uh, and this is what they came up with. Um, from feedback, we found that our timetable portlet uh, was the most um, highly used portlet, so that got pride of place um, on the home tab. Um, this thing over here, this is a custom, uh, a local portlet in Manchester that's pulling content from our content management system. Um, and we use um, kind of data attributes on the HTML to specify audiences. Um, so when the content uh, is rendered in new portal, we filter out content that's not relevant to, uh, to the person logged in. So this person has uh, about six six slides. Um, other people may have fewer. Um, newsreader portlet. Um, I seem to have a few things twice. This is our this is our test version of the portal. So some of the data may be slightly incorrect. Um, so I wanted to talk about the, uh, the portlets that we have in regions. 
So this whole bottom area of the screen uh, is made up of um, a few different portlets. Um, here is the um, Averus portlet. Uh, this is the uh, community Imperial version of the Averus portlet. Uh, we've decided to, to have that on the screen uh, on the screen all the time at the bottom. And the add to Averus link that you get in the Chrome's uh, that's where they get rendered. Then the contacts uh, finds, find us region is a portlet uh, that uh, is just a very simple uh, custom portlet that figures out um, your relationship with the university and your affiliation to the different um, departments of the university. So your contact information can change. So, for example, if you're an applicant, then you'll get the, uh, the applicant hotline number. And if you're a student in a particular school, then you'll get the contact information for that school. Uh, and the same goes with the social stuff as well. So this is a separate portlet um, in that same region um, that gives you uh, different social links depending on. Um, so if you're, if you're a medical student, then you'll get the social links uh, for the medical school. Uh, okay, this this bit here, this is just done within the theme. Uh, so we have a, a custom theme. Uh, it's based on Responder, but we actually fought Responder and created a Manchester theme. Um, I think we, we probably could have achieved most of what we wanted uh, directly in Responder, but, but that's the approach we took. So um, that's where we are at the moment. Then the header area of the screen. Um, this is the standard search launcher widget. Uh, and then so that's a portlet uh, in a region. Then we have an email uh, link, which is another portlet in a region, which is a separate portlet to the uh, remaining uh, buttons on the screen. And that's really because we manage the code base for the logic to um, figure out your mail server uh, as a separate web app than um, the rest of the logic that renders these buttons. And then we have the, uh, the toolbar and the link to Blackboard, which is essentially just a tool item that's been pulled out. Uh, and this list is personalized, so uh, there's a whole lot of kind of uh, group membership checking going on to, uh, to, to decide which links. Uh, you should have access to. Uh, and then uh, that's not the real person. <laughs> um, we have our logout button uh, hidden up there and, and some, some kind of profile related information. And hopefully, I can show you uh, how this responds. Uh, so, if I scale it down slightly. Um, First, okay, uh, at that stage there, the labels, um, the labels disappear from the uh, buttons, and the uh, the whole content area of the page drops into a single column, and the footer um, pretty much just sh shrinks down accordingly. Really, no no real movement going on there, and. As I continue further down uh, onto mobile, um, it looks something like this. Um, so the tabs and the tool buttons uh, collapse into tabs and tools. So these are your tabs, and this is your tools menu. Um, the search in there, and the, the tools drop down uh, done as a, as a sub sub drop down there. Again, um, it's all here. It is still single column on mobile. Um, and we've actually got a lot of responsive content now. So a big part of the upgrade project was um, going through existing content and making it uh, bootstrap wise in it. Um, and the upgrade to bootstrap Three, three, five. I think it was. Uh, gave us the uh, embed, um, responsive embedded uh, 
capability. So uh, we have videos, uh, we have responsive videos, but we don't actually have one on this page, but we have one on another page. So one of the um, new pieces of content that we developed um, this situation uh, of the upgrade cycle uh, is this resource pack portal. Um, this was um, mostly a piece of work done by Pedro uh, Unicorn. Um, and it's, a, it's, a, it's different um, it's different than other portlets in that it, um, it it's really built on top of your portal, um, so it's leveraging um, a lot of the kind of uh, internal new portal capabilities. So we have these um, resources, uh, which may be external websites, or there may be articles, or there may be training courses um, that the students can book on, and um, for each resource, we have a book on the resource card, which is a piece of content that describes the resource and um, categorizes the resource um, and puts some tags around it. What the rest of yeah, thanks, Drew. Um, so we, we had all of these resource cards that we wanted to uh, make available within the portal and we wanted them to be um, searchable and we wanted to be able to do things like have ratings and uh, feedback on them. So Drew came up with the idea of why not model each resource as a portlet in its own way and then the, uh, the resource bank uh, database could actually be uh, just your portal and the portlet registry. Uh, so that's what we did. What is the resource? Okay, so it's just um, calling the portal search. Um, so it uh, just calls the portal REST APIs that give you the portal registry, and then it does like a client side uh, search over that data. Um, so there is a background job, there is a quartz uh, schedule job that runs. Uh, every night and reaches out to a piece of XML produced by our content management system, which reads in um, uh, so that the piece of XML uh, has a reference to each of the resource bank cards, uh, which is essentially a URL of where the content for that card is, and then a list of the audiences that that, that card should be targeted to, and uh, the tags associated with that card. Um, then the background job after reading the XML then uh, uses a internal new portal APIs to create instances of web proxy portal. Uh, so in our portal we have around about 500 portal definitions um, and uh, about 300 of them are uh, dynamically created. Uh, by the resource bank uh, background process. Um, then, uh, it, once, once the job's complete, uh, the, the act of uh, rendering them on the screen is, is, is quite simple, really. Um, this is really just a JSP with some JavaScript calling the portal APIs um, that pull out, uh, it's using the portal categories API to pull out. The, uh, the categories. And if I click on um, one of these links, um, it takes me through to another page, which is also uh, just calling the portal APIs uh, to get the portal registry and the metadata associated with each of the resource cards uh, to render the, the left hand menu primarily. Um, then each of these cards itself. Uh, is an AJAX call to uh, to the to the resource to the to the web proxy portal instance uh, in exclusive window state. Uh, so that, that AJAX call happens, and then the content just gets embedded into the page. So here, yeah, you're looking at uh, 
a like a dynamic layout really that's built by itself with a whole lot of JSON calls. Uh, and then things like uh, review um, or feedback on the content is just using standard view portal capabilities. Um, we, we added this share uh, capability as well. So I think that's that's mostly it really. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll put through some of the tabs so you can kind of just get a feel for, um, for what it's looking like. Um, this is a, an instance of um, the uh, survey portlet, the community portlet. Uh, these are mostly instances of web proxy, uh, although we do have some custom portlets. Uh, dotted around the place as well. This is yeah one two three four five web six web proxy instances and a uh, uh, survey portal instance. Some more web proxy um, newsreader, um, a sub Twitter. Mobile proxy. This is another instance of the uh, that feature port that I was talking about earlier. It was on the home page. Um, this, this points to different content, and this uses only got one card right now. One friend. Uh, I don't think this user has uh, has a full profile because it's a uh, kind of a synthetic user. Um, so, and the other thing to uh, to point out is that we've switched to using Marketplace. So you'll notice there's no customized draw uh, underneath the tabs. Uh, like you get out out of the box, and instead we've anchored this uh, marketplace uh, link down at the bottom, uh, which takes you to uh, the full screen view of, uh, of marketplace. Uh, we've also done a few enhancements on this um, just to make it render slightly slightly nicer. Um, And we've moved some of the buttons around in here. Um, so we've locked down all of the content uh, this time around. We've, we've removed the ability to add new tabs. And all of the pushed content is non-movable and non-removable. Um, so in terms of customizations, the only thing you can do is add content to existing tabs. And that content appears at the bottom. Uh, you can then obviously move around your custom content that you've added, and you can remove it. Um, but that's about it. We've really taken a lot, lot of the choices away from people. That was based on uh, feedback really, that, that people weren't really using it as much as we uh, we thought they might. Okay, then I think I'm I think I'm done. I can hand uh, hand back over. To uh, Drew or Jim. Great. Well, we can now um, take. Uh, we have a little bit of uh, questions, Q and A, open and uh, discussion, and uh, go ahead and ask your questions in the chat, um, and uh, we'll either answer them there um, or. I uh, try to answer them collectively, um, verbally. Um, I will uh, take advantage of the fact that I'm unmuted to quickly ask you a question, Anthony. I know that um, this is uh, your test instance of the portal, and that I, I believe you're looking at rolling this out into production next month. I'm wondering if you've had a chance to get this out in front of a collection of 
um, end users to do some user testing on it. Hi, uh, yeah, thanks, Jim. Um, yeah, we hope to launch we beginning the 6th of June, um, although we haven't got a final date for that yet. Um, but yeah, we have had um, a fair, fair number of students um, try it out, and the, the feedback's been, been really positive so far. Um, our old, I, I don't know whether that's because of the because we've done such a great job or whether it's just because it's an improvement from what we had previously uh the last time we upgraded uh did a big major overhaul like this was 2012 uh so that so the old portal was looking pretty dated so i think people are just happy to have a refresh uh, i also um there was a question really that I didn't answer. Oh, the rating part of the marketplace, uh, Bruce. Uh, yeah, we're not live yet, so uh, I don't have uh, any stats on, on what people are doing with that. Although there's been a discussion on the list recently started by Andrew Petro. It was a um, quite interesting take on um, ratings. So we'll see how it pans out. Yeah, Jim, that's right. The um, the there's a, a content management system uh, that has you know all the resources in the resource bank and in which the curators of, of the resource bank, you know, the the content authors use to prepare and, and update content. Uh, that that CMS provides uh, metadata about. Uh, resources in the form of XML, uh, and as Anthony mentioned, yeah, there's essentially there's kind of like two parts to the resource bank integration. The um, the court's job, the the sort of batch job that runs nightly, like you mentioned, that's inside the portal itself. It's a court's job defined in the um, application context of uPortal. It reaches out for this metadata XML document and processes it. It if it discovers stuff, it figures out what's there and and may, and as well as what's missing, uh, what used to be there but isn't there anymore. Uh, and it will update the portals, uh, the portlet registry and the category registry uh, inside your portal based on the metadata XML document. So all those things become portlets. And then in the resource bank UI side, uh, that is a portlet that is sort of entirely, um, it, it's a bunch of JavaScript. The, the portlet is, I think it's a simple JSP portlet. I, the uh, portlet markup is just you know, some empty template, um, uh, you know some some bare bones uh, DOM elements and a bunch of uh, a bunch of JavaScript then sort of wakes up and interrogates the portal to find out what the resources are and how they're organized and it um, uses DOM manip manipulation to uh, you know draw all the all the categories and metadata and the individual portlets onto the page. Uh, the they're not subscribable, Jim, uh, because you can't. I don't think you can find them by browsing. Well, actually, you can, you can in the search. So maybe that's right. Oh, I remember. Sorry, I should I shouldn't be speaking for Anthony. I, they're cut out of the marketplace, uh, the Portland marketplace. You don't find the resource uh, bank items there, but you can find them in the portal search.
Any other uh, questions that folks have? Uh, Martin, the uh, Unicon is working with two sort of uh, system level organizations uh, that have a, a really big in, interest in tendencies. We're working with uh, California Community College System and also with the Illini Cloud. Uh, and actually, for that matter, I should add uh, the Nebraska ESUs, the Educational Service Units. Uh, for K through 12 education in Nebraska. Uh, these system-wide organizations are, are, are interested in providing a portal to their constituencies at the system level that can nevertheless be branded for individual districts or individual community colleges. Uh, so it's, um, you portal adopters and contributors like these that that seem to be really driving this. I, I haven't seen any, I, I have not seen a university yet say, hey, I really wanna use this tenancy thing for my dental school. Uh, I think that's completely feasible. Uh, you know, I, I, want, I want a separate tenancy for the nursing school or for some professional program or, or, or something like that. I think that's completely reasonable and feasible, but I haven't seen that yet. Drew, you um, have connections to a lot of portal instances. Do you know of anyone using Tomcat 8 in production? Uh, in production, uh, I, uh, you know what, I think Oakland might. Is Oakland on this call? Didn't look like it. Doesn't look like it. Um, I think Oakland University in Michigan, they may. Uh, I... Who else had something right on the tip of my tongue? Uh, all of us at Unicon were using it for local development. Uh, we have Tomcat 8 uh, for all of our ePortal portals at this point. Uh, questions can continue to come in, but I did want to just take an opportunity to uh, mention some ways that folks can get more involved and take some actions. Um, things to consider. Uh, consider upgrading to uPortal 4.3 on your campus. And as you do, uh, whether you know, it, it go, if it goes smooth or if there are any issues, um, be sure to share that information on the user list so that others can um, benefit or help you out. Another thing, it's uh, uh, only a few weeks away now, but uh, hopefully some of you are attending the Open Aperio Conference. There's workshops on Sunday, as uh, we've typically seen in the past. There's a couple of uPortal related ones on Sunday. Um, the Monday of the summit of the conference, they're doing something new. They're having that be what they're calling an open summit. Um, a little bit more kind of a, uh, a thought and discussion day, um, as opposed to more heads down presentations. And if folks are uh, feeling like they don't want to um, participate in these kind of larger uh, thought and panel pieces, uh, it's likely going to be a U portal discussion and work day. Uh, we've got a room reserved that folks will be gathering in uh, just to talk over things. Um, there are a number of sessions that are uh, going on, and so you can have a schedule that's completely full, full of uPortal related sessions, a lot of sharing of information, um, you know, standard presentation styles, but uh, there's one uh, session in particular, the Roadmap Birds of a Feather session, where we're really looking for that to be a discussion as we shape the direction of view portal going forward. And then of course, there's gonna be additional collaboration opportunities immediately following the conference. Some people will be uh, hanging around for a while. 
Um, and speaking of the roadmap BOP at the conference, there's ways to participate if you're not going to be able to make it at the conference. Uh, we're going to try to increase the amount of on-list discussions about the roadmap, what people um, what people's thoughts are, what they'd like to see, what what's feasible, how people are going to be able to contribute. Uh, that will put us in good shape to have some more face-to-face -face discussions about the roadmap at the conference. But after the conference, we'll be following up and uh, sharing on the list what's going to be happening. And so, you know, really, regardless of whether you're going to make it to the conference, we're looking for opportunities for folks to share uh, what their thoughts are about the roadmap. Another opportunity to um, participate is demo your portal, just like Anthony did today. I think it's always interesting to see the variety of uh, of portals in production that are being used. Um, so you know it doesn't take that much; just do a screen share. Um, I think Anthony did a great job, and be interested to see some others as well in the future. Just uh, let us know if you're interested. And also, just uh, let's try to uh, keep communicating on the list of what you'd like to see in your portal, what you'd like to see at a at a future community call. Um, maybe if you want to uh, have a suggestion for a Google Hangout where we could just get together virtually and talk about a, to a topic for an hour, that would be great. You know, what are you doing locally? What are you developing? What kind of successes have you had? You know, all of that um, would be great to share. So plenty of opportunities for folks to uh, get involved um, both now, uh, before the conference, at the conference, and then beyond. Thanks, Jim. Anything else, uh, Anthony or Drew, you want to share before we close out today? Uh, no, thanks, Jim. I'm done. Uh, thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks again, Anthony, for your uh, demo. Um, that uh, certainly doesn't look like my father's portal. Got a nice modern uh, look to it. <laughs> Can we quote you on that, Jim? <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thanks everyone for uh, participating in the call. Uh, we're going to um, hopefully be able to get an archived version of this uh, posted for anybody that wasn't able to make it or if you wanted to take a, um, um, a review on something that we've discussed. I uh, do hope to see you active on the list and see some of you in New York. Thanks everyone. <laughs>